Yeah, about my foot fungus. Oh, wait, we're live? <laughs> <laughs> wait, let me check. Yes, we're live. All right, so, hey, welcome back to Uncanny Adventures. Tonight, we're going to play some Call of Cthulhu. I am Jeanette. I'm going to be the keeper. Um, and I have with me my, my dearest friends, the Spell Squad from Power Score RPGs to Annihilation Game. So I've got Scotty Hood. I've got Dylan. And I've got Katie with me, and uh, next next time we play, we'll also have another player joining us. Uh, mm. But we're going to play uh, Call of Cthulhu, The Reign of Terror, uh, written by Mark Morrison. And um, I'm really excited about this. Uh, hopefully I don't mess up too much. We'll find out. So, hi guys. Welcome back. Hi. Hello. Hi. Bonjour. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. I'm not doing that anymore. That's <laughs> one you'll get out of me, and that's all you'll get. I was about to say, you either get French or you get like Fat Albert. There's like no real impact. Sounds about right. <laughs> uh, yeah, Stick word to the wise, we apologize in advance for terrible accents attempts. Um, I don't. <laughs> no one doesn't. Uh, I do. <laughs> terrible accent attempts, and also because it's Call of Cthulhu, uh, the con can, content can get kind of weird or creepy. A little mad. Yeah. Maybe. Um, a little mad. So yeah, so just so you know, heads up, word of warning. That's that's all I'm going to say. All right, so before we jump into our adventure, why don't you guys, starting with Scott, why don't you uh, introduce your character for the evening? Okay, um... First off, never played Call of Cthulhu before, so this will be interesting, both mechanically and roleplay. I am playing Christophe Pressy. He is a very charismatic soldier who uh, is dashing and handsome, and he wants to go up into the higher ranks, maybe even becoming a general or a colonel. Maybe, maybe colonel. He'll probably settle for colonel. But more importantly, um, he wants the hand of the beloved Melody. But uh, she's the daughter of one of the higher ups, and he's having none of it. So we got a little bit of a Romeo Juliet thing going on. Like we see each other in church, and you know, so and she's like, so and you know, we, we know what's going on. But, <laughs> sup, girl, sup. <laughs> yeah. And her aristocratic father is having none of that. Mm -hmm. The big wig, quite literally. All right, Katie, who are you playing tonight? I am playing Joseph Hugel. Also known as um, uh, uh, Martine Hugel, I am in disguise because my sweet, sweet husband, Joseph, um, uh, he, um, I took his place uh, because his, uh, his, his leg was amputated, right? Is that right? I think that's right. Yeah. Yeah. He was, like, yeah, he was injured. And I, I love that one of my, um, my, uh, <laughs> One of my like traits is I love my one-legged husband, Joseph. <laughs> um, yeah, and my spirited sister Therese. Um, yeah, I am. Uh, I'm a. I despise the monarchy, and I would love to see my country uh, independent again. Um, I uh, try to keep away from people who might actually know my husband, who should have a wooden leg that I do not have. Um, I'm very adept at maintaining my uh, skill or my disguise and uh, being a provisioner as my husband was. Excellent. And Dylan, who are you playing tonight? I am playing uh, Jean Dupois, a 50-year-old soldier from Gascony. Uh, he's been in the army 25 years. He's never gone past the rank of private because he's kind of a surly drunk. Uh, he's a devout monarchist, so pretty much the opposite of Katie's character. <laughs> uh, and, uh, oh, that's right. His uh, wife died last year after 20 years together. So that's fun. I'm sure that <laughs> that makes him quite happy. <laughs> It doesn't. That's a lot. So, rounding out this uh, group of 
French soldiers. Uh, they have their sergeant, <laughs> Sergeant Renault, who is a uh, very stern but fair leader who uh, has varying opinions about the men that serve underneath him. But as far as uh, leadership goes, he is uh, very trustworthy and very level-headed. They also have their comrade, uh, Babin, who has taken his leave to go and retrieve his uh, son from college and bring him back to Paris for uh, his break from college studies. His son, César, is studying to be a doctor at Montpellier. And their friend, Bomin, who is another soldier, and he is a very idealist, like very, very much an idealist. Let's see if I can get louder. Somebody said I'm quiet. <laughs> What? <laughs> no, I, mean, I joke. I joke. Sorry. Let me know if I sound a little louder now compared to everything. All right, so we're going to begin. Huh, so, prologue to our adventure. In June, 1794, we see a two-wheeled cart with high wooden sides that rumbles through the streets of Paris. It's drawn by a tired-looking horse. Men and women stand in the back of the cart, some downcast, some weeping. One man holds his head high, his back is to us, and we can't see his face. The cart passes along a street lined with crowds. They jeer at the occupants of the cart, laughing and making gestures by drawing their fingers sharp sharply across their necks. But not everyone is mocking the carts. A middle-aged woman with two young girls, aged seven or eight, pushes forward and looks anxiously at the cart. She hugs the girls tightly to her side. A broken old man shakes his head as the cart goes by, while a, a dog with a black ear runs after the cart. A soldier curses and aims a kick, and the dog howls and runs off. A young woman with close-cropped blonde hair stands by the road, silent, face heavy with grief. A bearded man, his face lined with worry, leans on his crutch and yells a name in anguish, but we can't hear him over the jeers of the crowd. And a young man, his face old beyond his years, looks at the cart with an air of resignation and turns away. The cart continues. Soldiers clear the way and they keep the crowd at bay. Finally, the, cr the cart rolls into a large square. At the center stands the guillotine. The crowd throngs around it. The cart reaches the base of the guillotine, and the man steps out first, his head held high. We see his broad back as he ascends the steps of the guillotine. The executioner steps forward to push him down, but the man kneels of his own volition. We hear the clack, clack, clack of women seated below, knitting, their eyes fixed on the platform. The blade is poised, a shining length of bright, sharp steel. The light glints off a small pattern on the blade, a concentric circle. The crowd holds its collective breath. Time stands still for an instant, and then the blade falls. And then we backtrack five years to the night of June 2nd, 1789. You are all on duty helping as you've been assigned outside the catacombs of Paris. They're currently moving the bones from the graveyard into the catacombs because there is just too much overcrowding. So you have all been assigned the task of overseeing this. As a few nights ago, there was some trouble and the police could not keep the crowds from causing damage to the cart and beating up one of the priests who was helping with this. So. As you all mill about, your sergeant is standing off to one side. He's talking to a very rotund man wearing a large wig that's sitting slightly askew on his head. He's sweating profusely, even though the night is chill. And as the men walk by carrying the skulls and bones, he points down the stairs. He's breathing heavily as if it's hard for him to talk. And he's telling them which way to put the bones and which way to put the skulls as they descend into the catacombs below. So, 
What are you all doing at this point? You are assigned to keep watch and to make sure that there's no trouble. And you could do a number of things. Uh, you could help carry a lantern down into the catacombs to guide these men who are working. You could help unload some of the bones and bodies from the cart and carry them with them. Or you can stand by the street side and just keep watch and make sure no one causes any trouble. I'm probably going to be at the street side making sure there isn't any trouble. So one, <clears throat> my job, because I, I want to eventually be a higher ranking someday. And two, see if there's any poor ladies who need some comfort <laughs> while they're mourning their dead ones being moved. Oh my god. <laughs> oh, I already hate you. <laughs> <laughs> I am going to be uh, holding the lantern and guiding these soldiers. Okay. I'm probably at the street side with uh, Cressy. Okay. Because the, the bodies and stuff kind of make me uncomfortable. God, I don't know. I don't know any courage here. <laughs> So there are a group of priests who accompany the cart with the bodies and they stay by the cart and let these hired hands move the bodies out and into the catacombs. And as this is happening, uh, you, you can see very, very easily that the hired hands basically detest these priests because the priests are of an upper class to them and they have no qualms about cursing at them under their breath as they pass. Some of them even kind of spit at their feet as they go. Uh, but they continue to do their job because in desperate times, it's very important that they make their wage for the night. And it's also pretty late. It's probably after midnight here. So there's not a whole lot of other foot traffic going on at that point. So, um, Hugel, you are carrying a lantern and you are helping these men, uh, kind of guiding them with a light down into the catacombs. So when you enter, it's a very tight spiral stone staircase that kind of descends down into the darkness mm -hmm. and as you come down to the bottom the, the the tunnels are very sort of dank you can see in some places roots coming out you can see these like bones piled here and there there's even bones that have been used to sort of build the facade of the wall uh mm -hmm. why don't you give me a sanity roll <laughs> as this sort of creeps you out as you see this First roll of the night, guys. <laughs> and it failed marvelously. Nice. Don't go crazy now. All right. So uh, you go down and uh, as you get down and see all of this, it kind of it kind of shakes you up a little bit. Uh, so you lose one point of sanity as you feel this kind of chill go down your back from this just dark, dank. I have 69 sanity. Nice. Area. <laughs> Let's see. So, meanwhile, on the street, you can still see uh, the two of you are standing uh, a little ways away from the sergeant, and he is talking to this doctor who you were introduced to. His name is Dr. Regalt, and you were told that he apparently is uh, a physician of the court and has actually been uh, charged with taking care of the dauphin, the... Uh, heir to the French throne because he's been very ill of late and so the doctor is dealing with that during the day and then overseeing the transport of the bodies at night <clears throat> yeah. and uh, as you watch you can see his eyes are like heavy he's still breathing heavy and he's like skulls to the left bones to the right skulls to the left and at some point he just just like <clears throat> pointing because he can't say it anymore. He's just worn himself out too much. So as you stand and sort of watch this and look over your shoulders, you're both startled by the sound of clattering horse hooves that are quickly approaching from down the street. You turn and you look back up the road and you see a carriage. It's white with red trim and it's speeding so fast that sparks are flying from the wheels underneath. You get a quick look at the driver. He seems to be clad completely in black. His face is masked and he's just driving toward the workers who are crossing the street with a couple of bodies heedlessly. 
You realize in an instant he is probably going to run them down. He does not appear to be intending to stop. Do you mm. want to? Do you want to do anything to try to help these men? Could I fire off a shot? Mm. Sure. Maybe not. Maybe not to hit him, but maybe scare the horses off course. Sure, you can actually roll me an intimidate for that. Okay, so newbie time. I rolled d hundred, right? Yep. Okay. You said intimidate. Yes. Okay, so that was a 62, and with my Intimidate, it says 15. So uh, you fire off a shot into the air, and this driver doesn't even seem phased by the shot going off. He flicks the reins, in fact, to speed the horse up, and now is almost on top of these two men. Dupois, is there anything Mm. you want to do in this instant? Uh, I'd like to sh- oh, I'd like to shoot the guy. You want to shoot the driver? Yeah. Okay, roll me uh which which weapon are you using? Uh my gun. Okay, so roll me for your musket I believe you have? Yes, I have well actually yeah, 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 yeah I do have musket. Yep. Key. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Well, that was a failure. <laughs> All right, so you aim and you fire off another shot. It goes clear over the head as you misjudge the distance of the speeding carriage. The driver never even looks in your direction as the horses in the carriage plow over the men in the street and continue on as the men are flung to the side in bloody heaps to left and right. You see the sergeant is running in this direction screaming, What's going on? And the doctor is huffing behind him. <laughs> he runs over and looks at them. What happened here? And you see just in the darkness, the carriage disappearing from sight down the street as it goes. Report, what happened here? As you see the doctor leaning over these men. A, I'm assuming a rebel came in with a... With the vehicle and just just hit all of the workers. It's poor men. Wait, mm. off the road. As I'm like trying to get people like out of this out of here. If pedestrians are starting to come over and see what the hubbub is. Yeah, the, there's a cup the other workers like have put down bodies and they're running over to check on their comrades. The sergeant looks around, he says, They didn't even slow down. No. They did not. This is insanity. Meanwhile, uh, both of you can roll me a spot hidden check. Sure. Okay, this time I'll use roll 20. The green one, right? Yeah, the green, the green one. Okay. Uh. I spotted something. Okay. So uh, you notice there's a scra- like a piece of paper that's sort of like floating down after all the hubbub as these uh, other workers are yelling, cursing into the darkness where the carriage went, Damn the Ristos! The hell with you! And they're looking over their friends who the doctor stands up and he's like, They're not going to make it. Take them into the catacombs. <laughs> and he starts lugging and he uh, starts lugging himself back over to where he was sitting on the cart. So... Uh, you see this paper kind of fluttering and you kind of scoop it up and pick it up and you're looking at it and it looks like some kind of pamphlet you kind of flip it open and printed on the inside it says in big letters at the top what is the third estate and then there's three questions and they're kind of in smaller print and then there's three answers in bigger print so the first says what is the third estate? And then in huge letters, everything with an exclamation point. Then it says, what has it been? What has it been until now? And it says nothing with an exclamation point. What will it become? And it says something with an exclamation point. So you recognize this as uh, there's been a lot of um, propaganda that's been being printed. Uh, there's, you know that in Versailles, there's a, a huge sort of a conclave of different groups meeting. The, aristoc- the aristocracy, the middle class, and the poor are all represented. And they're trying to figure out the government of France under the king. 
And this stuff has been being printed more and more as this becomes kind of a hotbed issue amongst the people. It's sort of to get the, the poor to kind of get involved in this and let them know what's going on. I, uh, I guess Christoph just sighs because this has been going on. And it's just like, oh, what a miserable time we live in. As I go over and start helping take some of those bodies in, the ones that are still alive, I guess. Mm. Yeah, okay. Dupois goes over and uh, sort of messes with the guys who are like, you aristocrats, blah, and just like gets them back to work. They they uh, look at you and they look like they got a little fight in them, but one of them kind of sla slaps his friend on the chest and says, we need the coin. Get back to work. And yeah. They'll go back and start collecting bodies out again and start moving them away. Scowl at them. Uh, Pressy, do me a favor and make me a, um, make me a luck roll. So, a luck roll? Is yeah. that a skill? <laughs> yeah, so on your character sheet, you have a, a luck. So the way luck works is uh, you make a luck roll for certain things when I ask to see what things may happen. You can also spend luck if you're uh, rolling another skill and you're close to a success, but you fail. You can spend some as many luck points as it takes to get there, but they're deducted from your total. So as you spend them, your luck... Or if you need to skirt death. Or if you need to skirt death. The only thing you can't use luck for is you can't use luck for sanity checks. Well, I guess I'm lucky for at least the first try. Beginner's luck, I guess. Yeah. Okay, yep, so you get an extreme, so so you're helping move these bodies, and yep, you're doing fine, no worries. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> All right. Here, here's me, not, not the character. Mm. So, um, so the doctor uh, has gone back, he's wheezing heavily from having had to walk the short distance to uh, help the, the men that had died. And he's just leaning there, wiping his brow, which is fairly comical because he's he's wiping at like the makeup and stuff that he has on his face, and mm. he's he's making kind of a, a serious mess of himself. So, a while passes and things kind of calm down. The workers get back to their regular level of grumbling. Um, at some point, Hugh Gale, you you come back up out with your lantern with one group, and another group goes down into the catacombs. And all of a sudden, there's a whole lot of yelling. You hear heavy footsteps running up the stairs out of the catacombs. And you see these workers that had just gone down, just bolting out and, and dashing into the road, like away from the opening. Oh, what did I miss? And they're like, there's a monster down there. We're not going back down there. Oh, my God. No. What are you on about? What are you, children? Restless spirits, monsters. They're, we, we can't go back down there, it's haunted. The only monsters are us men. No, you don't <laughs> understand. The eyes, they glowed. We had to run. You are obviously seeing things. We're not going in there, it's too dangerous. They'll eat us alive. Regalt sort of sits up, the doctor. <laughs> he takes a big breath and he's like, get back to work now. And they're like, we're not going back in there. We're staying right here. There is something dangerous down there. We have no way to protect ourselves. And Regalt looks at your sergeant and hmm. says, shoot one of them and the rest will go back to work. Okay. And the, uh, I, the sergeant. I look at the sergeant. What? <laughs> he uh, takes... And he looks at Dupois and he says, yes, Dupois. Mm. Choose one to shoot. Okay. But he seems a little upset, like, looking at his face, like, he doesn't want to do this, but he's following the orders because this man represents the king. Exactly. If I can, I look away. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'll shoot one then. <laughs> um... What is happening? <laughs> I walk away from you, chuckle fucks, for five minutes. <laughs> uh, Dupont will shoot the one that seemed to be the most argumentative, I guess. Okay, so you're gonna uh, 
shoot him with your gun uh, because it's point blank. And you see them startled, like they start to kind of back away. You actually get a um, a bonus die because yeah. you are able to do it up in point blank range. Wait, 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 Dylan, what's your musket percentage? Oh, uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> Oh, I don't know where I'd find that. All right, so it's on your character sheet. Uh -huh. And if you, uh, let's see, Dupois, if you scroll down about halfway on your character sheet, like all your attacks should be down there, weapons. So okay. it should say musket flintlock. Okay. Where's where's the, like, percentage thingy? Oh. <laughs> That's not a good shot. Jeez. Okay. Uh, so wow. So uh, you you actually like raise the musket and you go to fire it and you're looking at this man down the barrel of your musket and you're thinking to yourself, while you are a soldier and you have fought and you have killed in battle, you're looking at an unarmed man. You're looking at a citizen of France and for just a second you flinch and shoot and the the bullet goes the musket shot goes out and uh into like the side of the wagon <laughs> and the man sort of jumps back and looks around like surprised but i still need you to make a sanity roll okay Let's see sanity um the higher the higher the percentage the better you are at a skill right yes the higher the, yeah. percent, the better because you're looking for a low number so if you can get under you that wanna, you want to roll under your percentage yep gotcha Oh. That seems pretty good. <laughs> Let's see, what did you get? I got an extreme. Oh, wait. It didn't show up yet. Yeah, it doesn't come up. Oh, there it goes. There it All right. All right. So um, you do lose only a single point of sanity as you are a little shaken by by this. Okay. Oh, um, you gotta make the shot clean. Make it quick. I turn around and fire at him. What? <laughs> oh, <fuck. God> damn. <laughs> oh my. All right, so- God damn it. <laughs> Do me a favor and just roll me a sanity check. I hope a monster's eating me in the catacombs already. <laughs> Oh my dad! Well, actually, Hugo, you, you had just walked out with another group when all of this went down. Just, re just remember, we're just following orders. <laughs> then I roll sanity. <laughs> all right. Oh. Uh -huh. Let's see. So. so just following orders. <laughs> yeah. And uh, you uh, you shoot him, and he falls dead on the ground. And you, so you will lose one point of sanity as this unarmed man does collapse to the ground. And you are a little shaken by having uh, put him down. But the rest of them kind of look surprised and they go back and start picking up bones and bodies. They hesitate at the, at the opening of the catacombs and then look back and say, uh, maybe, maybe an armed soldier could accompany us again since we have to take these down even though there are monsters down here. You damn cowards. I'll go. Yeah, because I turned to my superior. Uh, so the sergeant looks around, he says, um, yes, uh, Beaumains will remain at the street with me if you three want to accompany them down and protect them from whatever this monster is. It's probably rats. Uh, Jeanette, did I see anything down there? Uh, no, you didn't see anything when you were down there with the others. It was just dark, dank, musty, and creepy. All right. So did the three of you accompany this group of men down into the catacombs? Yeah. I don't think there's anything down there, so. All right. So. Or Katie. <laughs> So as you guys proceed down into the catacombs, I need Pressy and Dupois to please make me sanity checks as the creepiness of this place does kind of settle in a little with you. Oh. All right. So uh, Pressy will take one point of sanity 
damage as uh, you you too feel this this chill uh, as you kind of go down and you see all these bones lining the walls and you step in a puddle and it's gross and sticky and there's a skull kind of that dropped on the side and is lying on the floor looking up at you and these men start uh, going along down this tunnel and the catacombs are very vast um, as you go <laughs> some places you have to stoop a little if you're um, almost six feet tall, you kind of have to stoop because the tunnels are low. Um, some of the tunnels are very skinny, but they open up as you move through here. And you kind of follow the group that's taking the skulls into their corner. And they're, they're bringing them into this bigger room and they're stacking them kind of on top of each other in a corner. And there's already a very large pile. And some of the skulls are like old skulls that the skin is already like melt, you know, rotted away from. But some of them are still like they still have the skin a little bit and they're like kind of gross and icky as they put them there um and as you're standing there i need you all to make listen checks for me god damn it (laughs) (laughs) fuck both of you (laughs) those games for me (laughs) it's cool because because martine is just sort of standing there with her head down mad that she walked out to see Pressy murdering someone in cold blood. I was about to say, you probably are like, besides the workers, you're probably the most not wanting to be here because we both just tried to shoot these guys. Yeah, I'm not happy. Yeah, I'm just sort of head down, (laughs) sulking. Okay, so Pressy and Dubois, you Mm. hear a noise off to your left down one of the, like, in one of the other side tunnels. So the two of you can roll me spot hidden. It's what you both deserve. <laughs> so you're, you're looking down this tunnel and you and you hear it's sort of this this crunching sound, but you can't see anything in the darkness down there. But it definitely sounds like something's making this crunching like. Like a, like a eating noise or like a stepping on bone noise. It it it's with, hard to tell from from over here. With my critical listen, you know, I'm able to discern that it sounds like somebody's like walking on bones, hmm. or if it sounds like with not walking critical, on bones. With your critical, it maybe sounds like something maybe gnawing on a bone. Uh, it's as the sergeant said, rats. Ugh. So Hugh Gell, at that moment, you you notice them both looking down this darkened corridor. You can roll me a spot hidden if you want to. I have Shagaths up here. Who? Katie. You, Gail. <laughs> yeah. I can roll one? Yes, yeah, because you see them looking and sort of discussing the sound that they're oh. that they're talking about. Uh, yeah, it's cool. I didn't even need to roll it anyway. Just gonna... <laughs> so you all, you look, and you're, you're not sure what they're, they're looking at or what they're listening to. You don't see anything but darkness down this tunnel. The men that you walk down with, like, are putting the bones down, and they're like, oh, alright, next load. We're going back up. And they start heading back toward where the staircase is. Okay. Dubois will shout down the tunnel. Who goes there? Rats can't speak. The gnawing stops. And you can hear like a splash. Like something moves. And then it, then it stops again. And now it's quiet. So Am I... God damn it! <laughs> um, am I beginning to hear this now? Yeah, you definitely hear this like splash, like something hit a puddle. I think it sounds more than a rat. Some weird monarchist cockamamie, perhaps. Let's make sure the workers still work. I'll take the rear. Yeah. Go up after the workers, then. All right. So as you guys uh, start following them out of the tunnel, and they sort of 
double timed it up and moved even though it's darker that way they they kind of headed back up as quick as they could i um, wonder why pressy you hear sound it's almost sounds like something's following behind you obviously gonna keep an eye behind me <laughs> make a spot hidden check as you're looking over your shoulder trying to see if you can spot something coming behind you All right, so you look back and you see a shadow. It looks like it stops just at the edge of your lantern light. It's sort of low to the ground. It's low to the ground. Is it, um, I, I, I guess I'll go D&D terms. Does it seem medium sized? Does it seem like our size relatively? It does look like a, a large, like maybe a person crouching in the dark at the edge of the light. And then, uh, the lantern light just illuminates these two yellow eyes that are staring at you. When, when I don't notice, to... when I don't notice like Pressy following behind, I'm just like, are you busy trying to shoot something? I'm trying to think what he would do in this situation. <laughs> I point my musket at this person and I say, did you get lost? Are you one of the workers? I doubt it. Now, quick question. Did you reload your musket after you shot the man up below? I would I'd assume being an expert with it, I would almost instinctually do that. Okay. Uh, so the figure does not respond to you. And it's not moving now. It's it's almost like it's melded into the shadow back where you were coming from. I can see you. <laughs> Come out of the shadows. Do you want to roll an intimidation check? Um, I'm really bad at that, apparently, but sure. <laughs> roll it anyway. It's fun. It's fun I'm to a, fail I'm in Call of Cthulhu. <laughs> I'm a lover, not a fighter, believe it or not. Ugh. I'll, I'll, I'll shoot. The the two the two yellowed eyes uh, sort of blink at the edge of the lantern light. And Hugel, you can make a spot hidden check to see if you see them reflect in the light. Okay. Uh, spot hidden. Nah, just I I I'm not. No. <laughs> nah. So Dupois, you've kept walking behind yes. the men. Yes. All right. At, at some point, you look over your shoulder, realizing that you are alone in a tunnel in the catacomb. They're, the men ahead of you beat you up the stairs, and your two comrades have you've left them behind somewhere. You hear We're an echo. You hear the echo of Pressy uh, saying, "Come out! I see you." I will go stomping back that direction then. You hear footsteps stomping back towards you, you Pressy and Hugel. I don't, I don't see anything, Pressy. It hasn't moved at all, right? Nope, it's not moved since you saw it stop. I keep my gun pointed right between the two glowing eyes. And I slowly start to retreat, but I keep facing them. But I want to see if it will try to advance as I retreat. Okay. So, Pressy, you start to back up. Hugel, do you back up with Pressy? Uh, yeah, if he begins to push back, then I'm going to go back with him. All right. As the lantern, like, moves, the light kind of moves further away. <laughs> Pressy, you see the shadow move to the edge of the lantern light again. And the eyes blink. And this time, Hugh Gallic, you actually see the shadow move as you're watching between Pressy and this hallway. And it looks like something just moves on all fours just to the edge of the light. What the hell is that? And then a, a femur bone kind of rolls out from the darkness with, like, chew marks in it. Okay, now I'm going to fire a shot. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, so roll uh, to shoot with your weapon. Watch me fail this. Just watch it. Oh, 
Oh, oh hard success. Wow. All okay. right. So, Pressy, uh, so Dupuy, as you're coming down around the corner, you just mm. come in sight. You see Hugel and Pressy's backs. You see Pressy has his musket up, and it fires as you round the corner. The echo in here is, like, a little deafening, the, the pop. Uh, and you see a spray of blood hit the side of the wall. It's kind of like a little dark. It starts dripping down, and you hear this, like, grunt. And then you hear the sound of something running away into the darkness. I still, uh, what, I still have the lantern, right? Yes, you do. I'd like to step forward across, uh, around Pressy. Not, like, far for maybe like a couple of feet, just to see if I can see if there's any blood or anything left, any more bones. Do you have any weapon drawn right now? I don't know. I have a weapon, but I don't have it drawn. I advance with you with my bayonet out. Okay. Mm. All right, so you guys, you step forward with the lantern, and you illuminate, like, the spot and where the blood is on the wall, and you do see a fair amount of blood, and you see a trail leading off into the darkness. One, once more, what the hell was that? Probably, probably some crazy. I mean, if someone's willing to run into somebody, into workers with a cart, who knows what one of these workers could have done if they got lost. It's pretty easy to get lost down here, if I remember correctly. It sounded like it was a law force. A- an animal? Given the right situations, all men can become animals. Dupont comes up behind you guys and says, <laughs> especially these revolutionaries. <sighs> They are at half animals themselves. You see me visibly jump. I actually like turn around. Freak out. <laughs> what are you shooting at? There was a creature. What do you mean a creature? I look at I look at Percy like it, it crawled on all fours, but it it didn't back away until I fired at it. Got a clear shot at it though. And, and uh, she points at the blood on the wall, the fresh blood. Is it? Does it look like, is it like red blood or is it like black, like ichor kind mm. of blood? It's, it's kind of halfway in between those two. Oh. But it's not, it, it looks almost like it, it might, it, it, you'd think it was an older blood, like it had been there a little while. Mm-hmm. Might have been a stray dog. So one of them mutts in the street. I wouldn't be surprised if they come down here to try to feed and remains on these poor people. You guys we. all hear heavy footfalls running up from behind you. And you see uh, uh, Michel Beaumains, the, the, other, mm-hmm. the other man from your unit, like charging in. And he comes running around the corner carrying his musket and stops and aims it down the hallway. Hold! What is going on? Vermin in the catacombs. If we treated further in. Dupois comes up to Beaumains and, like, puts his hand on his gun and holds it down. And he says, yeah. be careful when you point at you fucking idiot. I was told by the sergeant to come and check on you. He heard those shot go off. Hmm. Then how would the sergeant feel if you shot his own men? He would not be happy with me, I'm sure. No, he would not be happy with you. I'm sorry. <sighs> oh, give him a break. He was just worried. The, the oh, shut up, you idiot. You're shooting at stray dogs down here. We are supposed to be watching the workers. Yes, they're back upstairs. They're, they're scared again because of the musket shot. They said the monster must have eaten you. <laughs> there, There is no monster. It was a stray dog. He looks past at the blood on the wall. Oh, not anymore. It looks like you got him. Uh, it, good. it did run away. Perhaps it's going to die. Should we Could chase it down and make sure it's dead? I, I don't. I, I, I'm I sure Pressy got a good shot. It was point blank. Is there is there any form of like medicine check to be to discern maybe blood loss or anything? Sure. You can uh, go over and do a, a medicine check to see if you can figure out how badly wounded the creature was by how much blood is left behind. I'm, I'm thinking because Pressy actually does come from a nice family. Maybe he's thinking of, like, um, fox hunting or something, you know? 
Oh my god, am I bad at this? Here we go. <laughs> so Holy you... crap. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You look around, <laughs> you, you kind of shrug. I think it's dead. <laughs> we don't hear anymore, must be dead. Let's just go up. All right. So Bowmanes will turn around, shoulder his musket, and walk back toward the entrance with the rest of you. As I'm going back, I, I'm just since I'm just so bad at this, I, I turn around and I'm just reloading. I'm just reloading as we're moving, mm. if I can. Yep. Take your time. Just you know, you slow your pace just to get the musket loaded properly. All right. So when you get back up to the street level, uh, you see it looks like a horse and rider has come up, and you recognize immediately that. This man is Captain Louis Malone. He is your sergeant's uh, commanding officer. He sees you all and he turns and gives you a salute. And he turns back and he is in a hushed, whispered conversation with the sergeant and the doctor for a few minutes. The sergeant mo motions you back to the road to kind of keep watch. And then both Malone and the sergeant walk over to you. Mm. And he says, uh, the sergeant looks around to you all. He says, I'm ordering you to leave your post immediately. There has been an incident and I want you to go and take care of it. The sergeant is in charge of this. I want you to get to this situation before the police as they are incompetent and can't handle anything. And we need to make sure this is taken care of by our men. He That's says... True. I need you to leave here and go to the printing press at the Rue de l'Arp. We have a uh, word from the landlady, Madame Bossat. There has been a murder. You must get there as quickly as you can and find out what happened and collect any evidence you find and keep the locals away from the scene. Keep them out of the press. Keep them away from the bodies if there are any there. I need you all to handle this. Sergeant, and he... Do not let me down. And he goes back and mounts up on his horse and turns and gallops back the way he came. The sergeant looks around and says, Our work here is done. To your horses. We must go at once. Mm. So you all go oh. untether your horses where you uh, tied them up a little ways up the road. Uh, riding is not... I uh, won't make you make ride checks. <laughs> because you're not uh, going at any kind of gallop. This is, uh, yeah. you know, you're riding through town, so you're going to have to take it easy. And um, so the sergeant will lead the way, and you all know that the Rue de l'Arp is not far from here. Mm. So you ride away from the catacombs. You actually have to ride uh, through one of the gates of the city of Paris because Paris is surrounded by a wall. It's actually closed in by a large wall. So you ride in, and you come into the city itself. There is a lot of new architecture uh, out toward the wall. There's a lot of larger boulevards. There's nicer houses, nicer construction. And as you're riding in and you start to ride a little ways in toward the center, uh, the streets get a little more cramped. The buildings are a little older, a little taller. And you're surprised as it's now about 3.30 in the morning. You oh. come around a corner and you see uh, there's a bakery and there's like a small crowd already gathered outside the bakery. And they seem to be uh, yelling at a man who's standing in the doorway. And you can hear it's this- It's John <laughs> <laughs> I am so sorry. Oh I had to. That's my one. <laughs> I've actually been pretty good. I, I want to do a couple. <laughs> That's my one. All right, so. As you're riding, you see this little crowd that's gathered. And uh, you all know that the, the lower class citizens in Paris are finding it really hard to afford food. The price of bread has skyrocketed. It actually takes almost half of a family's income from lower class just to get a couple loaves of bread and feed their family. You also know that the it's in such high demand for the, the ingredients for the bread that there's like a waiting list at the bakeries, even before they get the ingredients and even before they make the bread, they've already sold their quotas. So if you're not on the list, you're kind of 
shit out of luck. <laughs> so as you're riding by, you see these people and they're yelling at the man in the doorway. And you can see behind him, he's got like his wife and his kids. And they are screaming for that they want their bread. They know he got a shipment in. And he is apologizing. He's, I cannot give you any bread. I am already spoken for. All of my supply is spoken for. You have to go home and wait for the next supply. And uh, there is nothing I can do. Get away from my shop and leave me alone. And it looks like the sergeant is kind of ignoring it and is just going to ride by and let this handle itself. Okay. Do I have any food in my pack? Like um, in my bag? You probably, uh, roll me a luck roll. Let's see. Yeah, because I've been so lucky with my rolls, Jeanette. Hey, you know? <laughs> yep, that, yep. 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 Can uh, I have to. Uh, that's so much luck to spend. Oh, that's so much luck to spend. That's what? 12 luck to spend? Um, yeah, that's. Uh, well, you rolled a 78 and it was. To be 60. An eight, so you'd have to spend 18 luck to 18. get 18. I, I was not that far off. <laughs> My math is getting better. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, I'm not gonna fish it. Mm -mm. God damn it! All right, so you you all ride past <laughs> as mm. this crowd is uh, yelling and the baker's trying to calm them down. I I, I am gonna I I'm not I, it just changes my plans a little bit. Okay, I'm going to uh pull my horse to a to a uh um to it to a to a halt um and to like like get off. And uh, like push my way through the, the crowd as a soldier, you know. Okay. Excuse me. Excuse me. Um, and go up, go up to the man. And uh, are you sure you have nothing you can give? Uh, nothing at all. Uh, I I I'm I'm sorry, uh, sir. No, I I have already have all of my supplies spoken for. I. There is nothing I can do. If I give to these, the people who have already paid will go without. And I cannot make up that debt. I have used the money to pay for the supplies. There are children starving right here. I, I, I know. It, it is a terrible time in for us Frenchmen. But we must... Do you not keep extra for yourself? Uh, no. We have, we have no extra stock. I'm sorry. And you hear the people, lies! You you could feed us if you wanted to. You have all. Can I roll a psychology to see if he's lying? Sure. Psycho. Oh, oh, that's a skill. Holy crap! Ah, ha, ha, success. Is he lying? Wow. Um. No. You. You know. Uh. That he is not lying. He is telling the truth. That I was hoping that would work. <laughs> <laughs> um. I ride up next to you and say, "We are not with the Son of God. We do not have infinite bread in these baskets. Let's move." You do, uh, uh, Joseph, when, uh, like, looking at him and kind of judging the situation, um, you, you think maybe you could try to, to either talk this crowd down or even maybe intimidate them, like, to go home? Um, yeah, that was my next. I was going to try to persuade them. Um, uh, she, I'm going to turn around and be like, I, I, understand, I understand your hardship. He, he suffers just as much as you do. Please go home, rest, and continue to try, just as good good Frenchmen do. Roll me persuasion. Extreme. Oh, so yeah, Hugel, you you speak to these these people as a, another Frenchman. They see you, even though you're in a uniform that they they tend to detest sometimes because it, it they see you as part of the aristocracy. When you talk, the way you speak to them the inflection, they realize that under that uniform, you're a Frenchman just like they are. Yeah. And yeah. little by little they disperse and they head home and leave the situation. You're welcome. I get back on my horse and continue. The, the baker's them. wife waves to you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, good sir. Have a good evening. And you ride and you catch up with uh, the rest of your group who continued on ignoring what was going on. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so. Fun times in Call of Cthulhu, eh? <laughs> rough times. But you, you, did, you did help a little town baker, so I mean, good times. All right. 
Like, I'm just trying to recover from Dylan playing a character who's a dick. I hate this. <laughs> This is like me saying, not this like this is not like me on Sunday not liking Dylan's character. I'm I am so thrown off right now. Yeah, I, I never play a douche, so this is interesting. Yeah, that's, I, why, this that's is, why I picked this character. This is complete 180 from me knowing you guys, and I hate it. <laughs> All right, so. Um, the sergeant, Beaumains, and uh, Dupois, you are first to arrive outside the printers uh, as it seems uh, Hugel and Pressy have fallen behind for one reason or another. You're not sure what's keeping them. Um, but as you ride up, uh, you can see that there is this long, dark tenement building. You ride and you can see like around the corner, the side of it, there's a side door. And even from the street, it looks like the side door has been smashed inward. It's kind of in pieces. Um, you also see that a group of people has kind of started to gather outside the front of the building on the street. And mm. they're sort of uh, carrying lanterns. A couple of them have candles. They all appear to be in their nightshirts as if they were woken from sleep. Uh, some of them are quietly uh, sort of crying, but others are starting to get loud and angry. And as you ride up, you hear cries about, The damned Aristos! They think they can do things like this! You also okay. notice, sitting on the stoop, sort of mm. staring straight ahead, not even responding to this group, not responding to you riding up. There's this small woman, like an older woman, maybe in her like late 40s, She's got a shawl draped over her shoulder, and in the moonlight, she just looks, like, pale white, and she's just staring ahead with this look of just, like, shock on her face. Okay. The sergeant dismounts. He ties off his horse. He looks at Beaumains, and he says, With me, we will deal with this crowd. He looks at Dupois. See to that woman, and... Figure out where the stragglers have gone to. Find you, Gel, and Pressy when you have a moment. Me. And they move over to start talking to the, the crowd that's gathering. Okay. Uh, I will go over to the woman then. As you walk up, she just continues to stare straight ahead. Oh, jeez. I say... Bonjour, madame. Make a persuasion check to gently try to rouse her. Or you can okay. try to intimidate her if you so choose to, to shake her out of it. Hmm. I, I will try to persuade it first. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ. Oh, my God. So in this private moment with none of his comrades around to see this, Dupois is a gentle soul to this woman who looks shaken to her core. To remind you of your dead wife? I was going to say, she probably does. So you, you lean in and you, you say bonjour. And at first she doesn't respond. And you probably like put your hand on her shoulder. Mm. And she turns and she makes eye contact with you. And you see just a tear roll down her eye as she starts to cry a little. And she says bonjour, monsieur. Is this... Uh... Your building? Oh, we, oui. I am the landlady here. Mm. We are told there is a murder here. Oh, oh it's all my, it's, it's my fault. It's all my fault. I told him, I told him, I showed him the door, sir. I showed him. Paul sort of stands back up. Sort of, he's not very good at the, the human emotion thing, so he's like, hmm. <laughs> at this point, you hear the clop of horses as Hugel and Pressy catch up. He he asks the woman, um, do you know who did this crime? She wipes the tears, and she uh, pulls the shawl a little closer, and she says, uh, it was... There, there was a, a, a knock, a curtain knock at my door. And I, I answered the door, though it was very late. And there was a dark cloaked Aristo standing on the step. He he dabbed at his lips with a, 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 a lacy handkerchief. It reminded me of a woman's handkerchief. 
but he dabbed at his lips with it. He says to me, he says, Ah, oh, madame, please tell me, where is Monsieur Raymond, the printer? He lodges downstairs, does he not? And I thought nothing of it. Many people come looking for Monsieur Raymond. So I said, yes, yes, there. And I took him and I pointed around the corner at the door. And he, as I was pointing at the door, I saw his carriage sitting parked. And she points at the street. Parked there. The door was slightly open on his carriage. And I saw, I saw a, a woman's hand f fall from the carriage and hang limp. Hang limp outside the door, I tell you. Just, I, I, I swear it was lifeless, hanging there. And he says, ah, yes, so that is Monsieur Ramon. Yes, now you, you woman, go inside and lock your door. And no matter what you hear, do not come back outside, is what he told me. And I saw the hand, and, and I ran back inside and shut and locked my door. And, and, and there was slamming. And there was screaming, and then, and then there was no more. This printer, do you know if he was a monarchist or a revolutionary? Uh, I, I, I do not know his business. I only, uh, he paid his rent, his family was kind, he, his wife and his two sons, and they were good tenants. Hmm. Thank you. We oui, monsieur. I'm so sorry for what I did. It's not your fault. So as the two of you, uh, Pressy and Hugel, dismount and tie off your horses, uh, just make me uh, spot hidden checks as you move in to the area. Success. Woohoo. Um, so Hugel, as you uh, tie off your horse and turn to walk over to where Dupois is standing with this woman, you see crumpled on the ground uh out of there's this white linen just lying on the ground i'm gonna pick it up all right so when you do you pick it up and it unfurls and it's this lacy white handkerchief it's silken the you know immediately by the touch it's it's of the finest quality because i'm a lady there's <laughs> there are initials embroidered <laughs> in the handkerchief Mm -hmm. The initials M A are embroidered in the handkerchief, mm -hmm. and there is a stain of red on the corner of it. Do I assume it's blood? Um, you, it, it definitely. Or you, at this point, it could be like dirt from the ground, but it does okay. have a little like it's a dark cut, sort of maroon brownish. Okay. Looking at this, being in this time and error, uh, the quality of this. Get, make me uh, an idea roll. Roll me an like a an, an an intelligence. I think it is. Yeah, intelligence. <laughs> oh, oh no, you don't I'm know. spending. I'm spending Are those you? nine points right. because no, that's so close. All right, so spend your nine luck. Yes, All right. that no, there's no way. So in this moment, holding this handkerchief and t and looking at it and the quality, um, you think of. Marie Antoinette, she's the only, like, the Queen of France, M.A., like, this is, this is that fine of quality, like, only someone with a lot of wealth would have something like this. Um, um do I see, um, um, my, uh, dear, uh, uh, um, superior, uh, Dupois? Uh, <laughs> like stepping away from the, the woman he was speaking to? Uh, you do see Dupois kind of moving back away from this little woman. And you can see uh, standing on the street side, you see the sergeant sort of back and forth with these night-shirted men telling them, come down! We are here instead of the police because we handle these things much better. The police can't be trusted. You know this. And they're like, you're an aristo scum too. Um, I walk over to Dupois and uh i hold out the uh the um handkerchief very carefully sir this is uh i just found this it's, it's some you know my my wife works in provision selling things mm. this is very very high quality and look at the initials m a 
Okay. Uh, well, seeing the handkerchief, I I look over at the woman. I'm like, what, what's she doing? She's, Is she looking our direction? She's sort of still like, she's watched you walk away, and she's like furtively looking back and forth up and down the street. Okay. Uh, I will tell uh, Hugel what the woman told me then. About the, um, she saw mm-hmm. the handkerchief? Yep. Could this be the handkerchief that was dropped? It seems likely. So you I guys... do not know uh, why it would have these initials, though. I I doubt that the Marie Antoinette would be here mm. in this area. <laughs> yeah, you yes. all think that uh, you all would think to keep this kind of quiet conversation because this that would be a like hugely like oh yeah a no no. Especially yeah. amongst the poor like this. You all you know that the poor hate her. Like with a passion. They despise her. Um so when you're standing there kind of looking around, you do notice, um, after Dubois talks about this uh you know, everything about the carriage and things like that, you can see where this a carriage would have parked. You can see there's actually like a pile of fresh manure where the horses might have like taken a dump. <laughs> Uh, so you can see it parked, like, right at the curb, at the entrance to the side alley that led to the door on the other side. The sergeant okay. sort of walks over at this point, and he says, uh, so, what have you discovered? Well, I will tell the sergeant what I have discovered. <laughs> then. Um, and, and Hugal is holding on to the handkerchief as long as, uh, as long as she can. Okay. Like unless they're specifically taking it from her, she's she's holding on to it. Well, as soon as the handkerchief comes up, the sergeant does want to see it. Oh yeah, she's showing it. She's not like mm. keeping it. The, 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 like unless they're taking it from her, she's going to try to keep it herself. But she's not like keep. She's not not. She's not withholding it, but she wants to keep it. You know what I'm trying to say? Yeah, but he mm-hmm. he does though. He asks for it. He says that oh, okay. I, I I must. Yeah, she reluctantly hands it over then. He folds it quickly, and he sticks it in a pocket to get it out of sight. And he says, um, does the woman know anything else? Mm, She did not seem to. It's possible. All right. Beaumains and I will keep the street. The three of you. Investigate the door. See what there is to find inside. Okay. I like to think, uh... He's just, he knows he's not the investigator type. But he's just sitting back listening to all this. Oh, you guys are going. I, I, I obviously will like do my job when need to. Mm. I'm not like slacking off, but I do whistle a fine tune, maybe like a, like a uh, recognizable church song or something, because he used to be in the choir when he was in the uh, monastery where he got his education. So for funsies, I wanted to do a sing chink. Okay. Ooh. Oh, wow. So while Pressy is singing, it actually soothes the old woman. She seems to react, relax a little bit. And even the crowd that's gathered there, they they seem to kind of calm a bit by this. Like, it's, it's, it's kind of a nice relaxing moment in this questionable darkness that's happening here. I like to think I just stop right when I step on the manure when I didn't see it. <laughs> There's a squish. And the woman looks over and says, Yes, that that is right where the white carriage parked itself before the man came to my door. And look, there's a cat. (laughs) (laughs) The pussy cat was attacking my boot. (laughs) It is a puss in boots. Oh, wait, you said a a white carriage? As I get closer to her. Did I have... Was it gilded or gold? Oh, it was white with with red trim. Red red trim. That's what I, that's what I meant. Yes. Okay. He's distracted by the shit on his boot. Don't worry. <laughs> the sergeant's like, go check out that door. Hurry up before the in, the police show up and try to take the scene. Mm, just, yes, sir. And uh, go. Yeah. Okay, so who is going to go inside first? Um, I, uh, I think that 
Hugo would actually sort of wait. Okay. I let Pressy and uh, Dupois go inside, and she would wait and try to run interference with the cops because she's mm. sort of a good talker. She she would try if the cops are like, as soon as she could get the cops to like leave them alone, then she'd go inside. Okay. But she would try to run interference with the cops. All right, so uh, Hugo stands outside the door, like a little ways up, because this doorway is sort of, it's about maybe a few feet down the down the alley into the side. Yeah. So, uh, Dupois and Pressy move to the okay. broken door. Um, it says here that I do everything at full speed. Reflection comes later, if at all. So I'm probably going to be first if no one stops me. Okay. Okay, so as uh, Pressy moves ahead quickly and moves to the open door, uh, you turn the corner and look through this shattered door, and it is shattered. It looks like something just exploded this door in from the outside. There are, like, pieces of it everywhere, and you you look inside, and the first thing you see um, lying is, is, like, on the ground, you see um, it looks like a slumped body of a dog. But it has no head. And the head is sort of a few feet back, lying on the ground, looking up, and the face is frozen in, like, its final snarl, like it was ready to pounce and attack before it was beheaded in what looks like a single slice of a blade. Um, you can see there's a printing press that takes up most of this room. Uh, you can also see that there's bundles of paper stacked all about and it looks like uh freshly printed pamphlets and things like that the room you smell ink and paper but you also smell like the 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 smell of blood like that rusty scent of blood in the air Mm. and as you sort of step through the broken door to get a better look at the room you see as you look up hanging from the rafters are four bodies. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> They're hanging, tied by their feet. Each body has had their throat slit, and the cuts are so deep you can see the bones. Oh, the- <laughs> I'm so glad I didn't go inside! <laughs> Dylan's freaking out, and Scott's just like, This, this yep, might this be... Fine. This is fine. You know, this. it says... Reflection comes later, if at all. This might be some reflection, maybe. Well, maybe. <laughs> this is when Pressy regrets everything. You, uh... Pressy never regrets anything. Pressy, you take in this, this scene, and you see it looks like a man and a woman, middle-aged, and then two teenage boys. They all appear as they're kind of s- sort of just rotating by these ropes that are binding them. It looks like each of them has something stuck, wadded in, in each of their mouths as they spin and uh there's like blood splattered on the floor but as you look there's like a pattern under each body and you realize that it looks like a bucket was placed under each body to catch the blood as it flowed out what do you do first thing i'm probably going to do is try to get the bodies down okay So when you move in, so you move into the room, you come around the printing press, and you actually see... Also also definitely let everybody know before they even try to get in. Uh, So you round the printing press, and you see um, alongside the press, there are four empty buckets now. And they all have, like, dried, like, drying crimson blood on each of them. But when you look from where you're standing, there's no blood inside them now. And... Make me a spot hidden check as you get more up close with these bodies and you can get a better look at them. Probably too grossed out by the scene. All right. So, yeah. So you you just kind of start moving in to try to take these bodies down one by one. Dupois, what are you doing at this point as Pressy has moved into the room? And he's kind of explaining what's going on. Well, Dupois, upon seeing this scene, probably does like the sign of the cross Things like sort of, and he sort of comes in. He helps get down the bodies. 
as the first thing. All right. So when you move in, Dupois, first make me a spot hidden check. Okay. Ah, uh, twenty. Oh, well, I don't see anything. <laughs> and now make me a listen check. As you start to like help get the father down first. Okay. Also, don't hear anything apparently. At this point, no regrets. Pressy, you can also make a listen check. Okay, I'm good at that. All right, so just barely though. Yeah, right. Just barely. Um, as you're pulling down the first body, which is the the middle aged man, uh, Pressy, you hear a low whimpering sound. It sounds like it's coming from a cabinet next to the printing press that's closed. Um, I, I guess I point that out immediately to you guys. Point, point towards it. Okay. Uh, Dupois will sort of have his gun at the ready, but not like point it at the cabinet. And he will slowly open and see what's inside. Okay, as soon as you open the cabinet, uh, a small white puppy with a black ear whimpers and cowers back Aww. at the sight of you. And... Oh, can I, can I try hey. and comfort the puppy? Deja vu. As you reach out, like, to try... It sniffs your hand, and it kind of rubs against it, and then it starts, like, nuzzling at your hand. And it starts trying to lick your face. Okay. I'll... I'll let it. It does that where it's like trying to climb up you and like get up close, mm -hmm. as close as it can. Okay, I'll get down on a knee so it can do oh, its yeah. thing. So Pressy, you see as Dupois is getting puppy kisses from this little white puppy with a black ear and it's just... <laughs> it looks terrified. Hmm. I probably am a little distracted by this because I find it adorable. <laughs> And as you're looking at this, Pressy, you... <laughs> Outside, he goes like, Is that a puppy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hugh Gell, do you, do you come to find the puppy? No! <laughs> no! Hugh, Hugh Gell, help me with these bodies. They're quite heavy. Don't pull me into this! <laughs> <laughs> I was perfectly fine! <laughs> Pressy, uh, you, you do notice something as uh, you're watching Dupois, like, comfort this little dog, and you see him, like, being tender. You you notice from under his foot, one of the pamphlets is, is on the floor facing up. And you kind of look at it, and it looks like the pamphlet that you found earlier on the road. It looks like that same pamphlet, except something has been printed across it in red ink. And it says... The same three questions and everything, but printed over the top, it says in huge letters that take up almost this whole paper, know your place. And as you look at it, you realize that that is not red ink. Oh. And you look at the buckets that have crimson drawing on them, and you look at the printing press, and you can just see like a gross drip of, like, congealing blood dripping off the printer. I like it. Yeah, at this, at this point, Hugh Gallup, she hears Pressy, you know, and she does, if she sees, like, a, a, a moment of exit with the cops, you know, she, she will duck in and see these bodies and okay. just sort of stare for a minute. Yep, What's see, that? You step into this site of the decapitated dog, uh, three bodies hanging, one has been lowered to the ground. Um, you see Dupois now has a small puppy in his arms. Pressy is holding a, a, a pamphlet in his hand. And just make me a spot hidden as you take this all in. Yeah, she's like looking around like, what, what has happened? Success. What? By one point! <laughs> so, 
as you're kind of taking this in, you're you're drawn up to like the the young boys that are hung upside down, and you notice that the older of the two boys. It looks like the paper that was shoved in his mouth, like it looks like it was almost completely like chewed out. And you realize that he was still alive when this happened, that he was hung and his throat was slit and this paper was shoved in his mouth, but he did not die immediately. He died slowly during I this. think, Percy, because you're probably, because Dupas distracted with this adorable puppy. <laughs> um, you probably see Percy for like, a just a moment Hugo's eyes like fog up like that's pretty emotional to her and she like we we have to get these down this is this is horrific this is this dis very disrespectful to these people she just wipes her eyes for a moment and goes to a uh, Go, goes to try to like get these bodies down any way she can. She's not the strongest person. <laughs> I'm, I'm not, I'm not the strongest either. But that's what I'm trying to do: is get these down. Does she notice is what you're holding? Does she? Does she does, you're holding that pamphlet out, right? Um, I was, but I, I, I literally did. I, I did this. I was like. Mm -hmm. Oh, got you, got you, got you. No problem. Uh, I was, if you had it, she was going to look at it. But if not, she's just going to get these bodies down. Yeah, that's her, her, her main concern. If you, if you point out the boys and, and that, I, I will probably prioritize them first. I don't think she like vocalizes it. That's where she's going first. Hundred percent. Yeah, that's heartbreaking to her. <laughs> Okay, so at, and as you start taking them down and you're, you're kind of taking in the scene a little more, from what you can tell, looking about, uh, it looks to you like um, the husband and wife were, were working at the typesetting table and, and they must have been caught unawares, like surprised when whoever the assailant was came in. Um, but it looks like the two younger boys, the, the teenagers, may have put up a fight. Like, there's signs of a scuffle further into the room. Like, the boys came to try and defend their parents and were unsuccessful in their defense. You also notice as you're moving them that these pamphlets with this Know Your Place are scattered everywhere. Like, a whole print setting of these was run through the printer. Yeah, so I'm looking as I'm taking the body, like, or trying to attempt to take the bodies. So I, I, I'm seeing them now, and uh, just like sort of moving them around with my boot. All right. While you're doing that, you guys can all make me a track check. Sure. Yeah, I knew that was gonna fail. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Yeah. Hooray. <laughs> yeah. They're good trackers. So as you're cleaning up the scene, uh, the sergeant does come in. So mm. Sergeant Renault does come in and he takes a look around and he says, oh, this is horrific. My God, I didn't think it would be this bad. How how many men did this? One, evidently. It can't, it can't be just one. This is too much. Too much murder, too much damage. All these the, the three three men. I mean, the, these boys were almost grown men, and he's sort mm. of looking around too. But he says, "Ah, oh, your your muddy boot prints have muddied up the floor. It's hard to tell how many there were." Don't you know when you first come into the scene to always be very careful about ruining evidence? Well, no. now you know for next time, Dupois. Don't don't shake your head at me, Dupois. Dupois takes a uh, his flask out and sort of takes a drink. <laughs> the puppy licks at the lip of the flask. Do I have a wine skin? <laughs> I give the puppy a little drink. <laughs> he, licks it, he kind of makes a face, and then he licks your face with his alcoholic smelling breath. Beautiful. <laughs> yeah, Presley could have a wine skin. He is a Frenchman. Okay, I, I hand that over to you. 
So as you are, you finish taking the bodies down, uh, you hear the sound of horses outside. And mm. coming through the door is the captain. So Captain Malon arrives. And you mm. hear him ordering some other soldiers at the street to uh, continue to help Bomaine's continue to keep the crowd calm. And he comes around the corner and enters the room. And he kind of... Soldiers, report. What are your findings? Four dead, one possible assailant, sir. Any idea who the assailant was? Mm. According to the woman outside in a uh, Aristo, in a white carriage with red fittings. What did he they look seem like? To... I forget. <laughs> <laughs> he is the same man we saw at the catacombs. He was wearing all black. Mm. It's best to conceal himself. Hmm. Sir. Anything else? Do you know why these these people were targeted? As? I believe they were rebels, as I mm. point over at other presses. I believe they were the one printing out the propaganda. Hmm. I will have to have some men clean this up. We can't let the uh, citizens here see this. This could stir up <laughs> dark feelings toward the aristocrats if they think that an aristo did this and murdered this man and his family. We. Oui. Renault uh, moves forward and he says, Sir. And he removes the folded handkerchief from his breast pocket. And he hands it and he says, This was found by my soldiers at the curb where this carriage was parked. So he takes it and he unfolds it and he sort of looks at it, feels the material between his fingers. Hmm. This, this is very dangerous. This to be found here of all places. This, he looks around at all of you, he says, you are all sworn to silence over this. Not a word to be spoken. I don't I don't think you all's even really paying attention at this point. She is uh, actually, like, looking over the, trying to make the bodies look as respectable as she can and uh, uh, praying over them. Okay. Yeah. So he, he looks and he kind of sees you doing it, but he won't interrupt you doing this for them uh he looks at you all and he says do not speak of this to anyone the day after tomorrow or i guess it is almost dawn tomorrow so the next dawn i want your whole company to meet me at the palace of versailles you are to ride and be there in the morning hours, find me, speak of this to no one. This is very important. No one can know about this. Do you understand? Yes, we. sir. We, sir. All right. You are dismissed. I will have the other men finish cleaning this up. Your work here is done for the night. He, Sergeant, take your men. Go about your business, get your affairs taken care of here before you head out. And he sends you on your way, dismisses you. And as you guys are leaving, uh, it is actually uh, dawn, like the sun is coming up now. Oh, jeez. <laughs> All right. You've been loving on that puppy for a hot second. <laughs> yeah, man. So what do you guys want to do? You have today, you're dismissed to go about your business. And then you have to meet back up and ride for Versailles. Um, so it, as Hugo like stands up and, you know, sort of wipes her hands clean of the bodies, she looks at Dupois and uh, Pressy and is like, I have some contacts I can perhaps ask about this family see if they had any more enemies outside of the monarchy since perhaps they were revolutionaries i do not know that i uh 
agree with the means of this murder, but... Nobody should be murdered this way. Nobody no. should be murdered at all, but not in this way. I have no respect for revolutionaries, but this is ungodly. It's cruel. I'm, I'm sure this doesn't matter, but what day of the week is it? Hmm. Um, that is a good question. We'll say it's, I don't know, a Thursday. Okay. It's Jundi. Making, making sure it's not Sunday morning. All right. No. <laughs> you gotta go to church? <laughs> <Whoa>. <laughs> gotta go to church for multiple reasons. Mm. So it's not the manche, it is uh, Jardi. Thursday. Okay. So do any of you have any business you want to attend to before we fast forward to the next day and heading toward... <laughs> I, I I would definitely just like to get some information on this family. Okay. That, that's all I, I genuinely do want to do that, but that's about all. All right. So let's see. Probably like just, you know, ask some, because like if I'm away from Presti and Dupois, hmm. I would be out of uniform and being the revolutionary I am, I, <laughs> I wonder if I actually know this family. Okay. Um, so you um guys all kind of part and go your separate ways for the the day to get your stuff in order so mm. uh hugel um you don't know the printer personally but you do know of like a group of them that have been printing these documents and things mm -hmm. um because with the meetings that are happening actually at versailles and the uh three different groups that are trying to um kind of come together to sort of restructure and help fix the financial and poverty problems that are happening. Um, they're trying to get the, the lower class public involved, to get push them to, you know, be interested in what's happening, to let them know what's going on. So they're definitely trying to incite them to act, not maybe not violently, but get them involved in what's happening. So, and having seen what you did, uh, you would know that uh, it definitely looks like someone is trying to sabotage that in a way of, it looks like someone is trying to get them angry, not just active, but somebody's trying to get them angry so that they respond in anger and violence. Because mm. this, for you, seeing this, seeing this printed on these pamphlets, it, it, probably made you somewhat angry inside to see this like it was an insult to what people are trying to do to fix france for the regular citizen um if i can mm -hmm. i'd like to see what happened to the catacombs like go back there and see if um they they finished or how, how much progress they made and okay. there's maybe a stray dead dog corpse found there or something i don't know yeah so uh you go back and it's after dawn and they actually have cleared out and closed it back up for the day. Uh, you know that they try to do the transportation of bodies at night because it's less disturbing. Um, you do run into a couple of the workers who are kind of picking up and leaving. And they see you and they say, what are you doing here? I thought you were off to something more interesting. Just wanted to make sure that... Uh... Was, wait, was anyone else after that cart and that dog, was there anything else that happened? Uh, no, once you all fired off your muskets down below, you scared off whatever was down there. And it was mostly a quiet night. I thought that the big fat doctor was going to keel over, but he managed to get his ass on a horse and ride out of here as soon as the sun came up. Wheezing and spitting the whole way. Hmm. Well, don't bury yourselves too much into drinks. What do you care? It only leads to more sorrow as I leave. They, you hear them muttering as they head back off on the, you know, counting their, their little bit of pay that they got for the night between the two of them. I was about to say, now I think about it, I don't think they could afford it. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> Uh, 
Dubois probably wants to find somewhere safe for this puppy, first of all. But I, I don't know. Like, as a French soldier, do I have, like, a house that I live in? You do have your own home. You also, uh, when you're, when you're working um, mm -hmm. or staying, like, in the barracks at Versailles, you, okay. you do have um, a bunk that you can keep. Uh, okay. And you, you do notice, like, as you're leaving with the puppy, the puppy has curled up in your arms and is sleeping comfortably. He seems I probably, very content. I probably take off my soldier jacket and I sort of curl it up in my arm and I let the puppy sort of rest there in the crook of my arm in he, the jacket. He will nuzzle in and just sort of, like, happily uh, kind of lay there every once in a while. Like, mm, mm. He seems okay, very, I'll very attached to Dupois. I will take it home because I don't want to just like let it out on the street because some fucking people are going to eat it or something. <laughs> well, I mean, actually, that's probably very likely. Um, yeah, exactly. If if Pressy ever does get to talk to you about this, because apparently both of you have a connection at least as drinking buddies. Apparently, mm. he helps oh. fund your drinking habit. Okay. <laughs> um, um, he probably mentions uh, that the local abbot he was raised at would probably be able to take care of the puppy during the day. Oh, okay. Okay, so I would probably say Dupois and uh, Pressy probably go out to the bar, discuss the crazy shit they saw today, get a drink. The puppy will sleep he'll... at your feet at the bar. Oh. <laughs> and he'll he'll see about taking it to the abbot then. Okay. So you uh, have a few drinks. You go to see the abbot. Um, the abbot, he says, oh, I would happily take care of the dog for you if uh, uh, would like us to. And you see the puppy, like, it stays by your feet. And it looks at the abbot and kind of, like, gives a, like, and it stays, like, behind your legs. Like, it, it doesn't want to go over by him. Oh. And it looks up at you as, like... <laughs> Oh, James Danette. <laughs> oh, no. I know what Dylan wants to do. <laughs> oh, no. You you don't even, probably don't even need to roll for this. Um, Pressy's probably tearing up a little bit. The, the puppy, like, puts his paws up on your knees and is, like, ah! pawing at your leg. No. <laughs> you know what you gotta do, Dylan? Put him in your hat. Like Forever. <sighs> Put him in your hat. He, he is, he's our mascot now. Dupois will, will look at the puppy. Norm normally, I'd be fine with this, but it's Call of Cthulhu. You don't want a pet in Call of Cthulhu. I know. Dupois will will sort of hold the puppy up and sort of nuzzle his his nose against it, and give like, it one last your pet, face. and uh, he'll say, "Out of way, my friend." And he'll hand it over to the uh, the priest. It, as soon as the priest goes to take it, the puppy's like. Mm -hmm tries to mm. nip his fingers, and he's like pawing at Dupois, like he doesn't want you to let him go. Um, I got a job to do. I can't keep the puppy. He, uh, the priest is holding him, and he kind of wrestles loose, and he runs back under your feet. Oh, no! Oh, no! <laughs> okay, I'll pick the puppy back up. He licks your face again. Oh, I I guess he's coming home with me, then. Oh, yes, so. <laughs> he, he looks over at the at the abbot one more time, and he's like, <laughs> I lean over to the puppy, and you, obviously you hear me say this. I'm like, don't worry, I don't like him too much either. He he <laughs> lick he licks at Pressy's face, and kind of like nuzzles his nose against it. This wet, cold puppy nose. <laughs> Pressy boops the nose, and then we go. Oh. Dear Lord. Um, so before the next day, mm -hmm. we have to ride to Versailles. Um, the last thing I do want to do is find, uh, Beaumains. Hmm. Okay, yeah, you can easily find him. He Question, because Beaumains is also a revolutionary. Mm-hmm. Does Beaumains know I'm a woman? Uh, have you told Beaumains you're a woman? Because you are very skilled at your disguise. I am, yes, I'm very good at my disguise. I feel like maybe I have told Bomaine's I'm a woman because we're both like in this together. Okay. Yeah. So I think I find Bomaine's and. Um, so when uh, you go looking for him, you actually find him. Uh, he lives in this little like walk up 
and mm-hmm. he answers the door when you go to find him and his like aged father lives with him he takes care of him so monsieur Beaumain senior is like hello how are you good day monsieur good day. Um, i need to speak to your son if possible of course ah uh, monsieur you have a comrade in arms has come to see you son and you see uh michelle kind of stoop under a doorway because he's super duper tall he usually tries to slouch a little because he's so tall he doesn't want to look like he's as big as he is and he sees you and he's like you girl my friend how are you uh we need to have a very quick conversation please of course father do you need anything i'm going to go talk to my friend and he said oh no son i am i have my wine i have i have my bread i am well taken care of you have and you have set me up with someone to visit while you are away and he says i am good all right father he gives him a peck on the cheek i will be back momentarily and he will follow hugh gale out the people who were killed were revolutionaries i feel like this might affect us what the i i mean i, I didn't pay too much attention what what were they doing <laughs> They were printing the the revolutionary pamphlets. Ah, they were raising awareness. Good, good, good. It's very not important. good. Not good if they were killed and, and the and the message printed in their blood was know your place. Hmm. We must we must be vigilant. We must determine who is is done this. We must keep our ears and our eyes open, my friend. Were you told about the handkerchief? Ah, uh, no. I was at the street uh, keeping the uh, the night shirted. Uh, would-be rioters in in check there was a handkerchief found at the scene Mm -hmm. very very fine material only the richest royals would have with the initials ma found on it that is interesting you think you think an aristo like uh, that that high up in the in the pecking order would be involved in something as grotesque as what happened the only witness saw an aristo at the scene hmm. in a bla- in a white a white carriage with gilded red isn't that uh the same carriage that ran down those two poor fellows apparently uh, i i didn't see that happen but that's what um Pressy and dupas said huh did she did she see him like did she know what he looked like we could find him just that he was an aristo ah oh, damn i know they all look the same Smug, wigged, and makeuped. Like bourgeois I just, ways. I just wanted you to be kept up to date so you could continue to spread the information, especially when our own people are being taken out in such large numbers. These boys were very young. Mm, true. And he, he reaches up and he scratches at his fake eye because it, it itches sometimes. And he, uh, he says, yes, we, uh, that the boys did not deserve what the fate they received. We, we must be vigilant, but we must be quiet because I know, I know the sergeants and Dupois, I know that they are, they're loyal to the king and country and they don't understand. Exactly. Um, take care of your father. We, we ride to Versailles tomorrow. Yes, I will see you at dawn by the, by the entrance to the wall and then. My father will be well. I have a young woman from down the street who will tend to my father. Oh, look, the neighborhood cat is coming by. (laughs) Good kitty. Oh, he is so friendly. My father loves him. He keeps him company. Damn pussycat. (laughs) They're everywhere. They're taking over France. (laughs) These damn stray cats. Yeah, she just, um, she says her goodbyes. And uh, yeah, that's all that I wanted to do before they left. He says, uh, he leans in and he pats you on the shoulder and he says, "Give yourself uh, my greetings." And, of course, friend. And uh, say hello to your uh, sister for me. You should probably keep your eyes elsewhere. Au revoir. Au revoir. Yes, take good care of your wife, Joseph. I'll give her your best. Merci. De nada. <laughs> All right, so uh, you all finish up your business in the city. um, And in the early hours before dawn, you meet 
at the entrance, one of the many entrances to Paris. And you can see outside the gates of Paris, uh, there are all of these like taverns and bars set up. Uh, basically, there is such a high tax to bring goods into the city through the gates that a lot of these tavern owners have built their taverns outside the walls to keep their costs down. So as you're riding through, there are many an option if you want to stop for an, uh, an early morning <laughs> beverage on your way out. Though the sergeant seems to be very focused on riding straight ahead and heading for Versailles. Well, eyes every bar. <laughs> I definitely don't. I don't. Mm -mm. No, thank you. All right. <sighs> Do you start There's to roll any... sanity check to see if I can get past all these bars? Um, you can roll me a power check. Okay. How? There's any drunk glasses. It's up top with your characters. I, I okay. But besides that, I do nothing. You better power through this, I swear. Ooh. <laughs> okay. Dubois uh, is focused this morning on his mission, and so he does not veer off, though he may take a couple swigs from his own personal flask. Yeah, I was gonna say. And uh, tucked under inside your coat as you ride is a small puppy who refused <laughs> to be left behind as you tried to, to make arrangements otherwise. He was having none of it. He wants to be with you. you oh, are this his... puppy's going to die and you're going <laughs> to lose all your sanity. Yeah, probably. <laughs> Worth it. <laughs> so you guys make this journey to Versailles. Uh, you head southwest out of Paris. Uh, and it's about a 10 mile journey. So it takes a bit of time, which is why you have to leave at such an early hour. Mm. Uh, you actually pass as you're leaving, like all of the wagons and stuff coming into the city like the farmers and things like that are starting to line up at the gates because it's a long process for them to get through and to get into town. And it's just a pain, uh, just so much like money that they have to spend in order to get their, their, you know, wares into the market. And, uh, a couple of them, you pass like broken down carts on the side that didn't make it all the way. And they're working on them trying to get going, but you manage to, make it without too much uh, trouble. And as you get down further away from Paris and into the open country, it's actually quite beautiful, spacious. Uh, Versailles is very beautiful. And it's such a contrast to the streets of Paris. I mean, every time you come here, it's striking because it's like a shimmering expanse of this finely manicured lawns and gardens. They stretch in all directions. There's all these gentlemen and ladies sort of promenading around in their finery, you know, jewels and all this. Like, so there's this the poor of Paris. And then there's all these aristocrats just living high on the hog. Um, <laughs> and you can see as you ride in that there's gazebos along like pathways in the garden. There's like ponds. There's you know that there's food like cheeses and fine wines and cake. It's, it's literally picturesque. So as you ride into Versailles, uh, it is just this open expanse of like, there's a front sort of driveway type area where it's sort of, it's like a circular shape around the sides where all these wagons and things park leading to the main gate with the palace in the distance and the gardens beyond that. And as you ride in, can you all roll me spot hidden checks? I need glasses. <laughs> <laughs> that can be arranged. Let's see. All right. And actually, if you have the stream open, I I'm, I'm looking picture. looking for trouble. Oh, the cat! Oh, <laughs> those <laughs> damn cats! It's another cat! Oh my god! <laughs> All right, so I actually put a picture on the stream page of Versailles, but I can put one up in the window as well for you guys to see. Okay. Let's see here. Da -da -da. Da -da -da -da. Mm 
do do. Turn that off. Versailles. So if you guys are looking in roll 20, this is the Palace of Versailles. And I also put it up on the stream. So let's see, what were these spot hidden rolls? Ah, Dupois. So as you ride up on your horses and you pass by these carriages that have, you know, their various uh, drivers sort of tending to them and, and brushing the horses and taking care of them, you're passing along this line of the sweeping driveway and you do a double take over your shoulder as you pass. Tucked between two carriages, you see a white, beautiful carriage with red trim and a surly looking manservant is standing, waiting next to it, just leaning against it as you guys ride past. No one else seems to notice but you in that moment. I, I like to think a random cat just like jumped from a roof onto my face and like <laughs> Well there are like servants and stuff coming by and like <laughs> Katie we can't hear you I know I'm on mute for a reason oh, okay. <laughs> because I'm freaking out <laughs> Okay um, There are servants and people like that moving past with like items that they're bringing in and like deliveries that they're making So there are a lot of people going back and forth here and some other aristocrats and things like that Okay, can I get off my horse and approach the manservant? Sure, you can dismount and approach the manservant. Okay. I will say, uh, bonjour, monsieur. Bonjour. Whose, uh, carriage is this? My master's, of course. Who is? The man who owns this carriage. Fucking piece of shit. <laughs> Got him. <laughs> Capus. You should, you should just do that in character. You fucking piece of shit. Well, you, I probably do. You, you see his uh, his hand sort of like comes to rest on the on the like handle of his whip that he has on his side, and he's oh. looking at you like through kind of like slanted eyes. You should move along, soldier. Your men are you're falling behind your men. Yeah. I will walk back over and get on my horse and I will ride, ride back up with the men and I will I'll probably tell probably tell them about the carriage Bomaines does a, a look over his shoulder whose is it? the servant would not say oh, what a bastard nah <laughs> You know those aristocrats who like to keep their privacy. No, they just like to look down their noses at us. It's their right to. <sighs> the servant's not an aristocrat, though. Yeah, he probably Exa he's Exactly, better. and uh, I'm going to dismount my horse and go over to the servant. Oh. Bomaines <laughs> will uh, dismount and walk his horse back and keep a distance, but sort of like watch. Okay. How much time does it look like we have? Um, you didn't get a specific time. You were told by the captain to meet during the morning, and it is early morning. It's probably about 10 a.m. All right, then Then I think I would join Katie then. Okay. Uh, I'll probably get back off my horse and go on. <laughs> yeah, we're yeah. coming, motherfucker! Damn! <laughs> the, sergeant, the sergeant will dismount and looks back and sort of watches in his waiting, like, with a questioning look on his face. Hugo uh, approaches the, uh... The, uh, the the aristocrat or not the, the servant and uh, says um, sir uh, but Wait. do you, you by order of the queen I, I must ask you very nicely to tell us who your master is uh, by order of the queen I cannot say as my master is a dear dear friend and I don't have to speak to soldiers move along you are just a servant, no? I am in a much better position as this being a servant of this man than you are as a soldier in the army. Hey, now, now, as I walk in between the conversation, can't we all just be friends? I'm no. being very friendly. I think that you should move along before you cause a scene. My master would be very upset 
you don't want to be punished. And why would your master be upset with a scene? It seems to me that you're the one causing the scene. We're, we're being perfectly friendly. Hmm. I'm having a conversation. Uh, by order of my master, you must step away now and go about your business. I think that your sergeant is waiting for you. I don't see your master here to give orders, just you. I speak in his stead. Hmm. What kind of master gives a lowly servant so much power? Perhaps I am not so lonely. You look very low to me. <laughs> is there is there any way I could discern that maybe he is the master pretending to be a servant? You could hmm. uh, make, uh, I would say, a... Maybe a luck roll. A luck roll, okay. Ooh. So, uh, you don't think he's the master. He's not direct, like, he's definitely not, like, an aristocrat. He's, mm. he's dressed nice as a servant would be, but he's not. And he wouldn't be standing out here in the street with the other wagon men and yeah. people like that, the servants. Obviously, we're going to get nothing out of this man. You wouldn't know anything about those murders last night anyway. Let's go. I say out loud looking right at him. I don't think this man knows anything about anything, honestly. He, he just smiles. This And it's really one of those disturbing, like it does not reach his eyes. Perhaps masters shouldn't hire such idiots anyway. On your way... Goodbye. Hmm. Looks like we touched a nerve. Pressy, make me a spot hidden check. Okay. As you are walking away. <laughs> spin, oh, there's the, another cat. spin the look! Spin the look! It's so much! How, what, how, how? So you would spend enough luck to get it down to a 65, which would be a success. You'd have to spend 7 luck. You take how, how, do, how do I do that? So you go in your character sheet, you actually take the luck away from your luck total on your sheet. So you just have to, when you roll luck next time, you're just going to have to, you know, roll, hope you roll So this lowers lower. my, my luck skill, so to speak, yes. by spending. Yes. Eventually okay, you sure. can run out of luck. Yeah. <laughs> sure. I, you, I, I'm sure I will, and I will spend it on this. This seems worthwhile. All right. So you spend seven luck. Um... As you are turning away, you see, walking past the gate at the far end in the area of the palace, an older aristocratic gentleman with a young blonde on his arm, who looks over her shoulder and makes eye contact with you and smiles wistfully as they disappear behind the gate, continuing on their walk. <laughs> Percy's giving the guy has his biggest smirk on his face. <laughs> Percy's gone. His attention is gone for the rest of the day. <laughs> uh, Hugo just looks this servant up and down with the most like demeaning look. You know, like we're not going to get any more here. We should go. I agree. It's just sad the state of servants these days, isn't it? And uh, she turns around to go back to her horse. Sorry to cause the trouble. And I use my hat and do the formal bow and all that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He just watches you walk away. As you are mounting up and starting to ride, a, a young, like, page boy runs past. And uh, he mutters quietly as he passes by, uh, Yeah, you, sh you shouldn't talk to him. Nope, not at all. And he kind of keeps running ahead toward the gates. Thanks, random boy. <laughs> he disappears around like the gate. Was that like, us, or he was just muttering to himself? He, it seemed like he was like saying it to you because you had been talking to him, and he. Looked, what did he say again? He says, uh, you, sh "You shouldn't, you shouldn't talk to him. You should stay away." And then he ran around the corner and disappears through the gate. Okay. He got just like looks at the two of you, raises an eyebrow, and uh, you know, readies her horse to a. Uh, continue inside. Right. Press already seems over it. He's already moving. <laughs> Alright, so you yeah. guys ride through the gates. You ride over to like the, the soldier barracks that are on the property. Uh, your horses are taken by some of the stable boys and brought in and they're going to be watered and taken care of. And uh, the sergeant says, 
I will locate the captain. Uh, meet me at the servant's entrance of the palace. Uh, give me 30 minutes, please. Yeah. Don't get into any trouble. Mm. He, eyeballs, he eyeballs all of you back and forth. He looks at Bomains and he's like, Keep an eye on them. All right. And he will disappear as he's looking for your captain. And you are all left standing outside the barracks. You can see uh, Pressy, you see walking in the garden, this this old man with this woman on his arm. Every once in a while, she takes a look over her shoulder to kind of keep an eye on where you are. When the old man isn't looking, she takes a chance and just sort of does a... Okay, okay, so, um... Are there any, like, flower have, beds nearby? Is this, like, a have courtyard garden? Have I seen garden? this? Have I seen this girl? Make a spot, have I seen make this a spot happen? hidden, please. <laughs> I have such a low spot hidden! I know, it's great. I'm gonna try yes! to... Oh! I fucking yes, saw it! You have yes! seen it! Wow. Yes, I am literally going over to Pressy because in my bio, it has a thing that his love affairs are so cute. Because <laughs> So, I know about your ass, Pressy. <laughs> I'm going over to Pressy and just leaning close and going, do you think today is, is the best day for this? No, but <laughs> I guess every day could be a chance for love, right? God. Don't, don't you already have the heart of a wonderful young lady? I do, but... Apparently, it is not meant to be. I'm using the options I have. Don't you think that working harder for that one heart is more important than just dipping everywhere? Why does love have to be so restrictive? <laughs> love is the most powerful power in all of the world. Why should we limit it to just one? I'm not sure this is the correct environment for your thoughts on love, Pressy, with what's going on. It's not, we have a job to do. Exactly. So Dupois, while this other conversation is happening and you're playing with the puppy so you don't mm. notice anything uh you do catch a little bit of snippet as some of the aristos are uh walking amongst the garden and they get a little closer to the side by where the barracks are and mm. um you you see a couple of well-dressed men their their wigs very well primmed their makeup is spot on and they're talking in hushed tones and you hear one of them say it's a shame that louis joseph de france that poor boy, the dolphin, he is so gravely ill. Have you heard that it's consumption? Oh, I don't know that he'll survive it. I hear that they have a doctor taking care of him every day, and they don't think that he'll live more than a few months. They sent him back to Paris because they couldn't they, they couldn't keep him here anymore. He was too sick. And the other is like, oh, that is terrible. The crown prince were to die? Oh, that is, that is, that is just, we must, we must hope and pray that he will be all right yes indeed we must the poor the poor queen and king if they were to lose their their son in that terrible way poor monarchy mm. and uh <laughs> then you uh one of them says though i mean i don't know what the boy would inherit i hear that the king is broke he's all out of money and the other one says oh i think that's just a rumor didn't you see the reports that, that, that supposedly everything is fine. It's just the 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 lower class trying to stir up, you know. Oh, let's let's have our say in it. They're trying to get this uh, third estate garbage passed and get a parliament representing the people instead of our monarchy. Dupont shakes his head as he hears this. It's insanity, mm. but all right. Well, oh, are you going to go to uh, the count's party though? Did you did you get an invite? I actually got an invite this time. I, I'm kind of excited. I, I, it's they're so hush hush. It's oh, oh, you got an invite? I, I didn't, I didn't receive one myself. No. Oh, well, maybe I shouldn't talk about it then. Um, I must excuse oh. myself. 
<laughs> and he uh, he says, I'll take my leave. I'm going to go see if I can uh, turn the ear of that beautiful young woman walking there. And he kind of departs and heads down the pathway in the direction of the blonde and the older gentleman. <laughs> So, the guy going to the blonde is the one who got the invitation, correct? Uh, yes. Okay. How does he look? Oh, he is like this young, maybe 20-year-old, sort of tall, good-looking young Frenchman. On a scale of 1 to 10 on possible appearance, what do you think that would be? Um, have you ever seen uh, The Man in the Iron Mask with Leonardo DiCaprio? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Think of Leo as uh, King Louis in that one. He's kind of that like young, like really like ah, I've got all my stuff together, real confident. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. So, so do I see him going towards her as we're leaving? Yes, you do. You you have been paying very close attention to her, and you immediately notice this this young, good-looking Frenchman in his perfectly manicured wig and makeup walking with a big grin on his face toward her. He even like stops and picks a flower from one of the bushes and continues in that direction. <laughs> you see him He literally up- stole your game <laughs> after I cop watched you <laughs> He he walks up and he gives a a, a very a, like polite sort of bow to the older gentleman, and then does the whole takes the woman's hand and kisses her hand, and presents her the flower with a smile. <laughs> she kind of looks around and she over his shoulder makes eye contact with Pressy. Okay, so Pressy. What's his sanity? Okay, it's still above half, but I'd like to think he's got like a little angel pressy. And he's got a little demon pressy. And the <laughs> demon one's like, hey, are you going to stand for that? You should go over there and show him who's the better fencer. Yeah, you're really good at the rapier. And the other one's like, no, remember, don't you want to get that promotion? We got to keep moving. And he's like, mm-hmm. and he shoes away the devil one and he goes. All right, so you guys are making your way uh, kind of across the property to be on time to meet at the entrance on the other side. Mm. You do notice, like, you hear all these other little, like, stories, like the local news of the day happening. Um, But you are kind of surprised that you don't hear anything about the murders last night. Like, for it being such a gruesome and grotesque and violent affair... Even though Versailles is 10 miles outside of the city, you're kind of shocked. Like, it's been kept on the down low. It seems like the captain has really put a, put a, just a squeeze on it. Like, don't say anything. Oh. Do you want to stop and talk to anybody? Do you just keep moving and go about your business? Um, I want to find other servants to ask about the servant outside. Okay, yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, they're everywhere. Like, literally, this place, if, if there's not, like, there's almost, like, probably more servants than aristocrats who move about and, like, are at work. So you could literally just be like, you, come here. Like, men, women, young boys, young girls. Like, I want to find a sweet little look, a uh, sweet uh, looking lady who looks about my age. Okay. Yep. Uh, make me, just roll me a luck roll. That's a fail. All right, so instead you find a crotchety old, like, doorman. <laughs> you, you almost stop this, this younger woman as she's sprinting past with, like, a pile of towels in her arms. And instead you sort of run right into this older man who was holding the door for her. And he's like, Whoa! Excuse me, sir. Hey, excuse me, sir. Um, I, I need to... It's perfectly fine. I, I need to ask you a question, please. The man outside with the white carriage with the red gilding? What about him? Uh, do you have his name? I don't have his name. Do you know who his master is? <clears throat> I do. Can you please tell me? Oh, well, he's 
serves Count Fenelik, of course. Count what? Fenelik. Fenelik. Um, thank you for your time. Uh, I appreciate that. You're you're very welcome. Make me a psychology roll. Okay. Fell again. All right. He seems constipated. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. I I look at him and just go. I hope you feel better later. Thank you very much. Mm-hmm. If I could do anything for you, please let me know. Of course. Uh, good day, sir. Okay. Good day. I, I'm, I'm going to go find uh, Pressy. He's okay. not far me- away. <laughs> Meanwhile, Pressy, are there any noble ladies nearby? Like a little gossip? Oh, my group? God. Oh, my yes. God. <laughs> Yes, there are a number of noble ladies nearby. What are you looking for? I go up to them and I greet myself as well as I can. Uh, they sort of giggle a little bit to see you like all dressed up in your shoulder uniform, and you're you're dashing, you know, got a like good look to you. They're, they they kind of giggle and, <laughs> hello, soldier. How are you? Hello, young ladies. <laughs> and then and he's gonna he's gonna ask I, I can't I can't put a bad act. Um he's gonna ask about um who the blonde was. Oh, the gentleman. Oh he is Marco Defibio. He's uh you know, young, he's from mm, outside of Paris, he's recent to the area, his father has money. How long has he been here? Oh, he's been frequenting the palace for the last five or six months. Inner monologue. Okay, I don't have a chance. He's already set up a full game with her. Mm. Thank you for your time, ladies. You're welcome. They kind of look at each other. They seem disappointed, and you hear one of them's like, oh, they always are more interested in the... The good ones always like the other good-looking ones. Damn it! Actually, how how do they? What, what? Okay, okay. What's their appearance? Oh, the girls. Oh, they're they're pretty. They're good looking. Like they're I, they're they're you know. The, I mean, they're dressed in these nice fine robes. They're done up. You know, these are. If they're, if, if they're not with any guys, so I'm at least nice enough to kiss them on the hand and stuff. All right. Yeah. They they will. Uh, you do the round of kisses. They all giggle and blush, and um. This guy's very white knight, so he's probably mm-hmm. actually literally saying, "My ladies." Uh, just make me a spot hidden check. Oh, oh god, okay. Um, are they you, wearing corsets? Is that what I'm spotting here? Um, they are, but as you, uh, <laughs> are, like, getting, like, you've done your rounds of all of them, you look up and you see the blonde across the way, and her cheeks are bright red, and she looks, like, oh, kind of taken aback. I, I pretend like I ignore her. She, she turns and puts her arm in the old man's arm and, and starts continuing her walk across the garden. Pressing press knows this game. The girls, oh, giggle the, as, the girls giggle as you walk away. Call of Cthulhu has now become the dating game. We're losing I'm Dylan. Dylan. I'm so sorry. Dylan. I'm Dylan's so sorry. dying. I hate it. <laughs> oh no. I see why I picked a Kenku for the other campaign. God. I love it. All right. So you eventually make it to the servant's entrance. Um, and you find the sergeant waiting for you. And he says, huh, it's, where have you been? You are taking forever. Pressy, stop impressing the women. Sorry, can't help it. This is why I'm married and have children. All right, I need you to come with me this way. And he will lead you inside. So, when he does, he takes you through uh, some side corridors, up a set of stairs, and into a... a, like, and this place is lavish, but you do notice as you move through it, as nice it is, as it is, you can see where it's kind of starting to fall apart 
Like you can see sort of the cracks in the facade of this wealthy to do that they're putting up. In fact, too, like now that you're inside, there is the faintest scent of like you think it's urine somewhere inside. Like it, it, it's got this like kind of gross smell under all the perfumery and all the flowers. Like they're really trying to put on this show. But you can see behind the curtain a little that it's not all good. Everything is not as up there as you may think. So he leads you in and he takes you to uh, one of the apartments that is on site. And inside the room, when you walk in, you see Captain Melon waiting patiently with his arms behind his back. He leads you through another set of doors. These are large and gilded into this like beautiful chamber. And inside you see sitting the big, fat, overweight, out of breath, Dr. Regalt, who is just <laughs> And he watches as you come in. He recognizes you from the other night in Paris. He nods at Pressy because Pressy followed her orders. And uh, he says, these are the ones that you say that we can trust then, Malone. And Malone nods and says, yes, these, these are the most trustworthy. They, they are the ones that found the scene. They can be trusted. You can tell them what we need to do. And he says, oh, all right then. Very bad news of what happened. The dead printer and his wife and the boys. Yes, very bad news indeed. Uh, but... This is this is the moment that I've been waiting for. I have been watching Fenelik. He has gotten too close to Marie Antoinette. Too close. She trusts him too explicitly. And he's up to something. It is his carriage that the captain described. I know it. It sits in the driveway now. It's the one that was at the scene of the murders. He tried to stir up unrest. <sighs> Fenelik is up to something. He's a danger to the crown. We need to find out what it is. We need to find evidence that he is. <coughs> <coughs> and he kind of coughs into a rag and he says, Pardon. He says, we need to find evidence that he is not who he says he is. I need people I can trust to investigate. I want, I want you to go to his residence and find me this evidence and bring it back so that we may show the queen that her trusted friend is no friend but a traitor to France. He's just German scum. <laughs> Can you do this? We, oui, sir. Oh, oui. Good, good, good. Oh, then, Sergeant, Captain, I leave it to you to give your men directions to the comp's residence. I leave it to you men to... Do your duty. Use your training. Do not get caught. Speak nothing of my involvement or the captain's involvement. Fenelik must not know that we are on to him. If he finds out, it will go terrible for all of us. He has the ear of the queen, and things can, things can turn us on us in a second if we are not very careful. Do you understand? We. Oui. Good. Uh, all right. Captain, I believe Baban has returned and is prepared to go with you as well. I trust him, too. He is a good man. And the captain nods and says, Yes, I will send for Etienne immediately. And you are excused by the doctor, who is now wheezing heavily and struggling to breathe after just the short conversation. And I just lost my internet, didn't I? Nope, there it is. Everything froze for a second. I'm like, ah! <laughs> That's the end! Uh -huh. All right, so you uh, leave the room and the captain escorts you into the hallway and in hushed tones tells you, I am trusting you. Go. He, the Count Fenelik lives in uh, Poissy. That's a small town to the north. Figure out your plan. Be very careful. He is a powerful man and you cannot trust him or those that he has taken to his side. Do you understand? 
Hmm. We sat. And I think maybe we will call it for now. And we will come back next week to, or two weeks from now, to plan this next step. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, jeez. <laughs> yeah. We flown. Oh, we'll have Jamie. Yes. Atian Babon will be amongst the crew. Atian Babon. <laughs> Who, as you exit the palace, you see this tall uh, man in his, like, his uniform is, like, pristine. You guys know that he doesn't, he no longer has to do, like, dirty work usually because he, like, marches in parades now and shows off. And he waves mm. with his wooden hand because his real hand was blown off in an accident. Do you Dupla. guys want to know? Rolls his eyes. Do you guys want to know a fun fact before Jamie joins us? Sure. Do you want to know why Jamie picked this character? Why? Because they're handy. Ha <laughs> ha! I hate puns, and we all know. <laughs> um, okay, so in my home game, which Jamie plays in, I DM. We mm-hmm. have a character named Felix, who we all, who is a, a, a little thief. He, he oh. likes to loot things all the time, and we have a running joke that he needs to lose his hand. So Jamie picked this character to fuck with the person that plays Felix. <laughs> <laughs> that's fun fact guys because jamie's you know a personal friend of mine he I, I invited him to play with us we need another player so that is a fun fact that's why jamie picked this character nice. <laughs> that's funny that is awesome <laughs> he just wanted to like one hand so we can make one hand more one hand jokes okay you poor thing <laughs> I support it. I, oh, I, cool. I, if I could find a reason to take that player's hand, <laughs> trust me, I would. <laughs> but it does not work right now. <laughs> hmm. I mean, you could always do like, you know, like a squishing trap. Mm. That could work. Listen. Find the hand of Vecna. See, that would be my thing is like, I would do it and she'd find some reason to fuck me right back over as a mm. DM. Mm. <laughs> Anyway, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> All right, so, uh, so yes, we will stop there as the group has been given an assignment to find evidence against Count Fenelik, um, who apparently is deeply involved in these dark, dark underground secrets. Um, and we are going to come back in two weeks, uh, same time, 7 p.m. Eastern time, here on JE Briggs 79 Twitch. And let's do, uh, let's do a uh, Dylan. What you doing around the web? <coughs> Well, uh, I'm Dylan. It's very hard playing a dour asshole with no sense of humor. Uh, <laughs> Who now has a puppy? Who now has a puppy? Especially with Prissy in your party. Oh my god, right? <laughs> um, uh, you can find me on Twitter at KKRP2. I swear I play much better characters, like more happy-go-lucky. And other he stuff. really does! Yeah. I hate Precious Angel Dylan. <laughs> I hate this. Um, uh, you can find me on Thursday at 1 p.m. Eastern Time on the Greyhawk channel, uh, playing in Secrets of Castle Greyhawk. Uh, my character in that is kind of an asshole, not as much. Uh, <laughs> I love that character. Oh, damn it, Dylan! <laughs> very fun to play. <laughs> um, uh, Saturday on uh, Power Score RPG, you can find me playing Pleetal Ploplina, my Trek and Sorceress, uh, uh, I believe at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Um, and yeah, you can find me here Sundays doing stuff, these guys. Because that's what we do. That's what we do. All right, so Scott, how about you? Well, um... I also am playing a abnormal character for my <laughs> taste. It's definitely, oh geez. The, um, but I run two campaigns, Fridays and Saturdays. Um, this Saturday we're gonna we're gonna postpone it because power score. Oh, but yeah. um, normally I uh, Fridays seven o'clock Eastern Standard is my Retroverse campaign, and they're starting a new saga where they're not in the maze anymore, and it's oh. gonna be. A little more, um, a little more radical, to say the least. Nice. The, um, and then on Saturdays, normally at seven o'clock Eastern Standard, I have my Adventures of the Trackless Sea group, which they have explored well beyond the Trackless Sea. Now they are in the City of Glass, which is 
plane of water. And then actually currently right now, they're in Sigil and they are in way over their heads. So, uh, <laughs> Which is always a good thing. If you want to see them try to survive some cranium rats, uh, you know where to go. Oh, cranium rats. Cranium rats are so much oh. yes. not, not any like custom it was larger than normal swarms or anything. Mm. Nice. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> All right, Katie, what about you? I'm Katie and I do too much. Um, you can follow me on Twitter at Katie Face. Um, I also do the uh, Twitter for off the table, off underscore the table. I am a uh, cast member of our Off the Table. Uh, every other Monday, I'm a part of our uh, D&D 5E campaign, Tales from Thrasha. I am a part of our Burning Wheel campaign every other Wednesday. Tomorrow, if you want to come cry, uh, Burning Anghound. And then every other Friday, I'm a part of our Monster Hearts campaign, mm-hmm. uh, The Open Door. I just play a lot of sad girls. Um, these are all at 7 uh, PM Central Standard Time. I'm a part of a Dungeon World campaign every other week, uh, also at seven um, on Mort's Magical Wares. I'm also a part of tomorrow at one PM Central Standard Time. I'll be on Pro Starters channel playing Masks, a new generation where I'm not a sad girl. I am a villain turned hero who, when she saved a bank, she stole money from it in the first session. That's way to um, go. Yep. Uh, also uh, on the 25th. So. Next Monday, yes, I will be uh, GMing um, Monster of the Week Tales from the Swamp, starting on off t- off table. I'll be the keeper for that. I'm very excited. Um, I'll also be part of the Masks um, campaign starting on Wednesdays, uh, where I play a sad boy. Oh, I'm wow. switching it up, guys. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so- I know, right? Wow. <laughs> Um, sometimes I'm on uh, uh, Sean's channel playing Winra with these goofs who I love. Part of the spells, OG spell squad, guys. <laughs> I just do too much shit. I don't get to play as much anymore, and it really breaks my heart. Yeah. We, but, um, we get in trouble without you. I know. I have to keep sure. you guys in order. Um, but yeah, uh, I just do. Yeah, follow me on Twitter if you want to see where I am, because I do a lot of one shots on other people's channels as well. Um, I, can't, I literally do not know how to say no. That's my problem. I like it. <laughs> yeah. And, That's me. And then, uh, yeah, so I'm Jeanette. Uh, JEBreak79 at Twitter and here on Twitch. Um, I do a D&D 5e campaign every other Sunday. Um, I do Dylan plays in that. Scott has guest starred. Maybe one day we'll get Katie to guest star before the, before the bitter end of it, which may be coming soon. And... We just got a follower, so woo, thanks for following. Um, and also, um, we do, we're going to do this campaign. We're going to run it every other Tuesday night here at 7 p.m. Eastern time um, until uh, either they go insane, they die, or they complete the challenge that has been presented to them and save France from this craziness that is ensuing. And I play in Power Score RPGs, uh, Spell Squad team. I'm Rain, the Moon Elf Wizard, who... Uh, Likes to blow things up. And likes to die and give Winra heart attacks. Yeah, Rain (laughs) dies or nearly dies all the time. But yet they still That's her thing. That's her shit. So that's what happens. And yeah, so I'm just uh, enjoying Winra steals, Rain dies. Um, Exactly. Zed cast better to dying. (laughs) Pretty much. Uh, Just don't leave Rain alone, guys. Come on. We haven't learned our lesson yet. No. <laughs> but, um, and yeah, I just like, uh, I'm gonna keep running various games. We did some kids on bikes, which was mm. for me. But We're fun. gonna run a one shot on off the table after, like, someone had got it. And I was like, yes, do it, because I had so much fun. Yep. <laughs> so, so check back here for randomness of whenever I decide what I want to play and run. That's what I play and run. And, uh, also when I'm stressed out or trying to think of things to do, I play Sims 4 on my channel now just for the heck of it. <laughs> So, because right. why not? And it's and my character is actually Rain in human form. <gasps> so she's building a life in The Sims. That's what I'm doing. Because why not? All right. So that I think that's good. We're gonna head out because it's uh getting late and some of us have work tomorrow, which sucks. Yes. But thanks for playing, guys. And yeah. thanks for those who watched and for those who watch later on YouTube. Bye, everybody. Take care. Bye. Bye.